Thanks. So I have the distinct honor and pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Dr. Sharice Berry, who is the chief of the Division of Acute Care Surgery and Medical Director at NYU Langone Health and holds numerous national leadership positions, including the ACS division, um, division pillar lead, for a diversity pillar lead, I'm sorry, and is also the secretary of the Board of Governors. Um, Dr. Barry is also an NIH-funded surgeon scientist who's focused on health equity in the pre-hospital trauma system. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ho, for introducing me. It's great to be in a room full of friends and colleagues. Um, first, thank you, Dr. Legrone, for the invitation to be here and for Center. Uh, this is a, a topic of mine that I'm very passionate about, so I love speaking uh, uh, on this topic. So we're going to get started so we can get through the slides. So we're going to talk about health equity uh, metrics uh, and trauma. Slide. Not working. Okay. Um, so our objectives, uh, so we are going to describe the importance of achieving health equity within trauma. Uh, and in order to do that, um, we also are going to talk about the historical policies and structural drivers that have led to health inequities within trauma. And then the last half of the talk will be focused on what those metrics uh, should be. I have no disclosures. Um, so this is a graph uh, that shows uh, the racial and ethnic profile of the U.S. population on the left and on the right, uh, the 50 largest uh, cities where the blue uh, represents uh, white Americans, the darker orange represents to come from minority groups. And you can tell by the graph on the, uh, on the right uh, that people are, of color are already a majority uh, in 50 of the largest cities and uh, in six states have minority majorities. And so immigration to the U.S. really has tripled in the last 30 years, uh, representing the largest continuous wave of immigration in U.S. history. So given the increased diversity of the U.S. population, migration, and globalization, uh, we really must be equipped to provide care in a cross-cultural uh, context. And so as we define health equity by the CDC or the, the, um, the CMS, it's really the attainment of the highest level of health for everyone, that everyone should have a fair and just opportunity to obtain uh, optimal health, regardless of what they look like, what their social economic status and how they identify and what their preferred language is. And so it's important not only um, because it's the right thing to do, but it's important uh, for economics, for quality, um, for uh, surgical excellence. And so the business case uh, is that there's a potential economic gain of, a, gain of about $135 billion per year uh, if we eliminate disparities in health. And that equates to about $93 billion in excess medical care cost and $42 billion in untapped productivity. And so we often talk about equity as the sixth domain of quality, but often the forgotten domain of quality. And we know that equity in healthcare is important, um, and we share the common goal of trying to achieve uh, health equity for all, uh, but as for the Joint Commission, uh, we see how inequities persist with uh, maternal mortality rate uh, for African-American women being four times the rate of non-Hispanic uh, white women. Hispanic women are 20% more likely to die uh, from cervical cancer um, than non-Hispanic white women, uh, and Asian Americans are eight times more likely to die from Hep B, and diabetes are more than 30% higher among Native Americans. So the Joint Commission really now mandates uh, strategies for reducing health disparities, for screening patients for social determinants of health, and to uh, develop an action plan to identify 
on disparities within our patient population. And so the Joint Commission now offers this health equity certification. Uh, our institution uh, has been certified at NIH, uh, at, in, uh, sorry, at NYU. Um, and there are five domains, um, and we're going to talk about this in detail as it pertains to trauma in a bit, uh, but it's leadership collaboration, data collection, provision of care, and performance improvement. And so per CMS, um, payment determination will be tied to mandatory reporting of social determinants of health. So it was voluntary last year. Um, it's mandatory this year. Uh, and your payment determination uh, will take place by 2026. And for the college, uh, the highest priority uh, is surgical excellence. And so we know that health equity is fundamental to achieving surgical excellence. And what's coming down the pipeline is that our verification for both trauma and emergency general surgery uh, will likely be tied uh, to achieving uh, health equity. So it's important that we have this conversation and begin identifying what those metrics should be. And so the question is, how did we get here? I think it's very important that you have a clear understanding of the historical policies that have been rooted in structural racism that have resulted in inequities in care. And I noticed that Dr. Dicker had this slide as well. We're going to go through it briefly. Um, talking about the intersection of historical policy, structural racism that have resulted in uh, poor health outcomes. So we all know that slavery ended in 1865, but there were structures of racism uh, in place to maintain white supremacy and white privilege. And uh, was, we saw that through Jim Crow, segregation, redlining. Um, and so that resulted in a lot of poverty um, and we see that now in our social determinants of health. So we have poor access to healthcare, poor housing, poorly funded schools, poor access to capital. And so really it's structural racism that operates through laws and policies that allocate resources in ways that really disempower and devalue members of racial and ethnic minority groups, which has resulted in inequitable access to high quality care. And so the key policies that I think are important uh, are the black uh, are black codes and Jim Crow laws that really um, were legalized segregation at the state and local level. Plessy versus Ferguson, where the Supreme Court um, uh, legalized uh, a separate but equal, and the Flexner Report of 1910, which essentially closed um, all but two uh, black uh, medical schools. Mahari and Howard were the only two that remained, but some people estimate that would have trained 30 to 35,000 uh, Black physicians uh, over the past century, and then redlining, which is what we'll get to in a minute. I shared this slide uh, in, in the SAFER conference, but it's really just um, looking at the structural drivers that have led to poor outcomes. We talked about the historical policies in redlining, you have implicit bias, but then you look at all your social determinants of health, which are metrics that we should be incorporating into our registries that we'll get into in a bit, um, that have resulted in uh, poor outcomes. And so for redlining, um, this is a map of Chicago um, that uh, really takes into account what redlining is. Uh, so they were discriminatory lending process, uh, practices of the Homeowners Loan Corporation back in the 30s. Um, that excluded African Americans from obtaining government backed uh, home loans, really to like intended to guide uh, lending practices. So um, if you look at the map, um, you know, the, the areas that were considered less risky were green, and then blue, then yellow, and then the red uh, areas were deemed hazardous. And if you look at the right, um, looking at data from that 149 cities, uh, redline areas were uh, home largely to African Americans um, and people of ethnic minorities. Um, and just their mere presence really earned them a rate of hazardous. And so redlining has really contributed to the increased rates of firearm violence um, through the preclusion of home uh, ownership and poverty. Uh, and really it's been sort of resulted in the con uh, concentration of segregation of communities. And this is just a um, data that actually looked at the ramifications of uh, redline areas 
where we have increased poverty rates, increased um, uh, the rates of uninsured and obesity. And we know that um, the association between neighborhood uh, level racial segregation, socioeconomic factors and life expectancy results in a lower life expectancy. So it's really a key structural driver of a lot of the inequities that we're seeing today. And so um, it is at this point where we really need to have a call to action to really identify what those health equity metrics are and what they should be in trauma, to identify them and then integrate them into our databases, our registries, our practice management guidelines, research designs, and verification standards. And so if we go back to what the Joint Commission has sort of highlighted as a framework uh, from which to start with and looking at each domain and how it relates to trauma. So in the leadership domain, <clears throat> we really should be making health equity a, strate a strategic uh, priority for all of our uh, verified trauma programs, organizations, uh, and societies. There should be an identified strategic plan for reducing those disparities and providing equitable care for all of our patients. In finances, there should be an allocation of uh, resources and finances to achieve those goals. If you look at the collaboration domain, um, we should be holding our programs accountable for collaborating with patients and families and caregivers really to identify what the needs are uh, of our patients. And not just the patients, but, but the entire community. And if you look at the data collection domain that includes community surgeons and patients, um, we really need to be reviewing the data about all the socioeconomic or demographic characteristics and the needs of the individuals within our communities. And we need to be collecting self-reported uh, data so that we can improve the healthcare of the community. And, and so it's not just race and ethnicity, but it's SOGI data, so sexual orientation, gender identity, uh, the social determinants of health, and then real data, so race, ethnicity, uh, and language preferred uh, for medical encounters. We need to hold programs and institutions accountable for documenting a patient's preferred language and need for a language interpreter. And that should be documented in the charts of, and we should be collecting that data to ensure accountability of the use of an interpreter so you know, that patients um, are receiving uh, care that they can actually understand. Um, I often give this example of uh, a patient who was intubated in the trauma bay, not because this individual was altered, but because this individual didn't uh, speak English and nobody recognized that. Um, so this is a paper that came out last year in injury um, by Cora Canell and Dr. Bolger's on this uh, paper as well, um, that really looked at um, you know, look, look, utilizing a group of really diverse patients to understand patient perspectives and preferences on what these metrics should look like. And I showed this figure because when we talk about, a lot of times we talk about race and ethnicity and we just sort of use what's, what's given to us, the five um, races and, and, and one ethnicity, but there are subcategories with different cultures and different languages that should be appreciated and looked at to ensure that we are meeting everyone's needs. Um, <clears throat> language, are we asking about uh, fluency and the option to receive medical information uh, in more than one language? Um, you know, do we ask the question how well they speak English? Uh, do we um, ask what language do they prefer to hear or read medical information? Um, <clears throat> what processes uh, do our trauma programs have in place to ensure that patients with limited English proficiency are receiving equitable care. We should have an interpreter in the trauma bay when patients arrive. Uh, translation services for use for every patient encounter. Um, there is a study that showed that a lot of the informed consents for, for operations and surgeries are not even done in the language that the patient um, prefers or can understand. Um, so informed consents discharge paperwork should be in that patient's preferred language to ensure equitable care. So advancing language access, language translation services, literacy, and the provision of culturally tailored services is important. Um, so this is um, my colleague uh, at Stanford, uh, Dr. Lisa Knowlton, 
um, who has uh, been very proficient and has been leading the efforts uh, in this work of expanding uh, Medicaid expansion. Um, so the Affordable Care Act really mandated um, hospital presumptive eligibility or HPEs, which is a temporary form of, of, of Medicaid coverage um, really granted to uninsured patients. Um, and, you know, really the sort of beginning of the day uh, of uh, HPE, the approval was at 60 days. The patients really must file a full Medicaid application to continue that coverage. So it's really a pathway for obtaining full Medicaid um, with, you know, 70% of HPE enrollees and sustaining Medicaid at six months and having an increased access to post-hospitalization health care services. So she's really leading this, this effort in ensuring that our patients have access to care. Um, this is really something that we should be implementing in really all of the institutions and programs from across, uh, from across the country. For our surgeons and trauma surgeon leaders, we all should have implicit bias training. I'll do a plug for the DEI toolkit for the college um, or you know, self-education for all of our trainees and staff and, and attendings. Uh, really have a commitment to to and advocate for inclusive excellence. In that provision of care domain, um, really increasing diversity within, within our workforce and advancing a health equity framework in our research. Uh, very important about the, uh, diversifying the workforce, um, leading to greater levels of satisfaction in, in both uh, culture and linguistic barriers are reduced and improving the quality of care. Um, we know that we have higher prescreening scores that are associated with racial and ethnic concordance between patients and their and their physicians, and really, really focusing in on it's not diversity and excellence are not mutually exclusive; they go hand in hand. In our research, really important and to imply a health equity lens to all the research uh, that we do, um, it should be a part of the research requirement for trauma verification. Um, and really encouraging our, our colleagues to begin submitting grants uh, in health equity uh, so that we can further, um, you know, this research effort, effort, whether it's Medicaid expansion in the free hospital space um, or, you know, with um, the summit that Dr. Ho did on the advancement of focus equity research and trauma. This is going to advance the needle and ensure that we are meeting the needs of all of our patients. In the performance improvement domain, we need a health equity dashboard to really capture those, those data points. Um, we need to define the compliance rate for capturing that data and then define goals uh, that are within the joint commission and implement a process for opportunities for improvement. But we should be doing cultural environmental assessment for our trauma program verification, looking at access quality and outcomes within our programs uh, and policies and operations to close the gaps. And as Dr. Dicker gave a fantastic uh, presentation on trauma-informed care, here is our performance improvement domains. Trauma-informed care, social needs, and screening tools. We have a comprehensive post-discharge patient care plan. We have violence intervention programs. And what is our leadership response to health inequities? So in summary, we've sort of described the importance of health equity and in eliminating disparities within care by, through quality, through economics, We've described sort of that intersection of historical policies and the structural drivers leading to health inequities and poor outcomes, and describes what some of those health metrics um, should be within trauma that fall under the domain of what the Joint Commission now has in the health equity certification in all five of those domains. And so what are the next steps? We really do need to convene a Delphi census uh, panel of stakeholders identify and come to consensus on the health equity standards within trauma that CMS will pay for, and then develop a plan to integrate those standards within our databases, within our registries, within our practice management guidelines, within our research designs, um, and uh, for our trauma and ACS verification standards. And details for this event are forthcoming. Thank you. And then we have time for one question for Dr. Barry. Teresa, thanks. That was awesome. Um, I, it's just a practical, right? You got to it and the end there where you said CMS will pay for it, right? 
I get the cost savings, right? But when you're talking to your bean counters, there's a there's a startup cost to doing this, right? So how do we how do we get over that hump, right? Of the startup cost of starting to incorporate these things into our daily care. Yeah, no, it's, it always uh, comes down to finances, um, particularly when you're having those conversations with uh, the C-suite. Uh, I think it's going to really now, now that um, you know we have the the, the Joint Commission mandate, uh, the CMS payment determination, and now with the verification, those three things are very powerful motivators to get um, budgets to be changed to prioritize uh, eliminating disparities and achieving health equity. And I think that's really the only way um, some institutions are going to make it happen and it becomes regulatory. And sort of a requirement for the bottom line. You'd like to, we all want to think that everyone wants to do the right thing. We all want to do the right thing, but we all have bosses at a different level that are seeing things through a different lens. Thank you.